We have covered a fair share of murders that have shook this normally quiet part of England over the long centuries, with causes ranging from broken marriages, spur-of-the-moment actions brought on by greed, and in one case, the tragic outcome of two men's boredom. But this week, I bring you the sad conclusion of a long-running dispute over land, property and rent that sent shockwaves not only through all of Norfolk, but through all of Britain, brought one of the most famous authors in the country's history to the area, led to changes in how public hangings were undertaken in Norwich, and saw the end of a killer who, if local rumour is to be believed, cut short the lives of far more than he was ever punished for, leading to his waxwork featuring in Madame Tussaud's House of Horrors in London for well over a century. But before we get to the killing, first we must set the scene. The location and contested property in question was Stanfield Hall, located just outside the town of Wyndham, ten miles southwest of Norwich. An original house and chapel had stood on the site since 1249, belonging to a Richard Curzon, prior of Wyndham. For the next 500 or so years, it changed owners from the Biggards to the Apple Yards to the Flower Drews, and the building itself changed and dilapidated over time until we reach 1792, the hall and land now owned by Reverend George Preston. He redesigned and rebuilt the hall to the height of Georgian fashion, and the whole project costing over £7,000. Like all manor houses in the country, the land owned was used to house tenants, who either paid rent for their homes, or worked the land in return for housing. Among these tenants under Preston was a man named James Blomfield Rush, although some sources claim his middle name was Bloomfield. Born sometime in early 1800, he was the illegitimate son of Mary Blomfield. His biological father was unknown, but he would gain the Rush name in 1802, when she married John Rush from Old Buckingham. John seems to have been a kind, caring stepfather, making sure James was educated, sending him to the grammar school of Mr Nunn at Eye in Suffolk in 1811, and it was possibly this that led James, as he grew, to fancy himself more as an up-and-coming squire than a simple tenant farmer, but often was let down by his long history of being terrible with money and generally being extremely arrogant towards people. On the 28th of May 1825, Rush married Susanna Soames, and the pair would have a large family together, living as tenants in several farms around the area before settling at Stanfield Hall in 1835. Despite protests from family members, who warned him that the £500 a year rent would be the ruin of him. Rush also seems to have been somewhat of a want-to-be revolutionary, keenly reading books on the French and the American revolutions, was a member of a revolutionary club in Norwich, and even took part in the 1830 swing riots, an event that we will cover in future. Despite all this, he was clearly a trusted tenant in the eyes of Preston, who appointed him as his bailiff, making sure other tenants paid up on time, as well as fixing any problems the landowner might have. Life in Stanfield would seem to carry on without too much incident until 1837, when George Preston died, leaving the property to his eldest son, Isaac. Any hopes that Rush had that his life would simply carry on under a new boss were soon dashed, when Isaac not only removed him as bailiff, but cancelled the lease on his home, claiming the one that had been made under his father was not made legally. Possibly, he just had a dislike for Rush and wanted him gone, as he was quick to reissue a lease, but with a much higher rent attached, an act that was taken as well by Rush as you can imagine. Tensions between the two men would flare up again in the following year, when Potash Farm, located next to Stanfield Hall, came up for sale. As landowner, Isaac was keen to buy the farm, but so was Rush. And when Isaac let slip that he would pay no more than £3,500 for the property, James knew exactly what he had to do. In a sign of defiance, he outbid his landlord, buying potash for £3,750, but soon hit a slight snag. He didn't have that kind of money, but was somehow able to persuade none other than Isaac to loan him the money. It was done in the form of a mortgage, and Isaac agreed to give him until the 30th of November 1848 to pay him back in full. As much as this undoubtedly annoyed him, Isaac was forced to put his problems with Rush out of his mind for the time being anyway, as problems and claims on the property from with his own family were soon beginning to raise their head. It had all started in the summer of 1838, when he began to sell unwanted items from around the hall and the estate, 
including his father's old library, something that had been strictly forbidden in the will. Two members of his family soon claimed that this had forfeited his ownership and the hall now rightfully belonged to them. One was Thomas Jeremy and the other John Lana. Jeremy was also annoyed that Isaac had ignored another part of the will's request, that upon taking over the hall he was to change his surname to that of Jeremy, the name of his aunt who his father had originally inherited the hall from. Of these two men, Thomas seemed to be the far more reasonable and quieted down about his claims of land as soon as Isaac agreed with the name change, becoming Isaac Jeremy, leading to his son, who had already been given the old family name as a middle name, becoming Isaac Jeremy Jeremy, and someone who, to save confusion, I will refer to as Isaac Jr. for the rest of the video. John Lana, on the other hand, was not a man willing to compromise. As far as he saw it, the will had been broken and the house was now his. He arrived shortly after, demanding the key be handed over, Isaac simply refused and had him escorted off the property. Over the next couple of months though, he would return again and again, each time to the same result. Until, on his final attempt, he didn't come alone, instead bringing with him around 70 men, who forcefully took over the hall. Rush even tried to get them out on the orders of Isaac, but to no avail. Lana sent him away, saying the hall was now his property. His rather unconventional ownership, however, would be short-lived. A detachment of the Dragoon Guards, helped by local police, were called for, and he and his little band were soon driven from the house by force. John Lana was arrested and imprisoned for three months, and ordered by a judge to never go near Stanfield again under the threat of transportation. The family problems had seemingly died down by 1840, but Rush's life had improved little over those two years. If anything, it had got worse. He was now in huge amounts of debt all over the place, and his farm was going to rack and ruin, and was only heading more downhill as the years ticked by. Rather conveniently for him though, or so he might have thought, his stepfather John died on the 17th of October 1844. He was found in the kitchen with a bullet wound behind his ear and a gun laying next to him. It was reported as he had accidentally shot himself, but given the attitudes at the time, this was possibly a way to help the family save face if he had committed suicide. Although locally, several suspected someone had helped him along his way, and it had been none other than James who had been out shooting with him that morning. John left a decent amount of money and an estate in his will, estimated at around £7,000, all of it going to his wife Mary. James would not see a penny of the money he so desperately needed. The next death that surrounded him came about a month later, and it was that of his wife Susanna, although there is little suspicion attached to this one, leaving him with nine children to look after, and leading him to hire Emily Stanford, a widow, as a governess to look after his children, a woman he would also start a relationship with and have another child, even promising to marry her but never going through with it. Possibly this was just a ploy to get her services for free, as among his list of debts he could now add Isaac to the list as he had begun to fall behind on his rent and mortgage payments, leading to him being taken to court in 1847, where Isaac was awarded damages. Damages Rush had no way of paying, much like he had no way of paying his rent, mortgage or other debts in full. And with each passing month, that deadline of the 30th of November 1848 grew closer and closer. He was in real trouble and desperate for any money he can get his hands on. So, you can imagine, there was a great deal of suspicion when his mother suddenly died on the 13th of August 1848, with even a local nurse commenting that she believed she had been poisoned, although nothing was ever proven. Whether the death was natural or not, James Rush was met with somewhat of a surprise when the will was read out, and he discovered that his mother was clearly no fool. She had left her son nothing in the way of money, instead all of it going directly to her grandchildren although he did gain ownership of a farm that had belonged to John near Framlingham, but if he thought this might help ease his money worries, he was mistaken. The farm's tenants seemed to be about as good with money as he was, and was far behind on rent. In his normal action-without-thinking manner, James's first reaction was to threaten to shoot the man reading the will out, but after some time to cool down, he thought of a different way to get his hands on the money. He forged a note from his bank, saying that he had made a trust account that would look after the money until his youngest child turned 18, and effectively took it all for himself, but found it was far from enough to cover his debts, still owing around £5,000. 
leading to no other option than to declare himself bankrupt. With little option left for Rush and his family, other than the streets or the workhouse, things were looking bleak, when suddenly contact was made by John Lana, still burning with hatred towards Isaac. He told James that if he could get Stanfield Hall back for him, he would lower his rent back to an affordable rate and help him out however he could. The agreement between the pair was witnessed by both Emily Stanford and one of Lana's lawyers. Emily later confessed she had done so, including signing forged mortgage documents, in hopes doing so would lead Rush to finally marrying her. We may never know if the other parties involved realised exactly how far Rush was willing to go, but things were now being set in motion that were never going to be undone. The days leading up to the fateful night, Rush was acting strange such as going out in the late of night on the 24th of November, apparently to look for poachers, or so he told Emily, only to return covered in mud, and spending most of his nights sorting through and burning various papers. On the 26th, Isaac was summoned by James to Stanfield Hall to discuss the upcoming deadline payments. Any hopes that Rush had that an extension might be granted were refused. Things had clearly gone on far too long, and far too much money was now involved and it seems that if Isaac was not going to be paid back in full, he just wanted Rush and his family gone, a new tenant brought in to run the farm properly so he could start recouping some of his losses. The exact content of the meeting is not known, but whatever it was seems to have sealed the fate of everyone involved. November 28, 1848 came, just two days before Rush was meant to have paid off his mortgage to Isaac, and to the outside world the day was like any other. But within the Rush household, he was acting strangely again. He'd been able to hide it for most of the day, but it was while he ate dinner with Emily at their normal 6pm, he was clearly distracted by something. When Emily asked him what was wrong, he gave some vague, rambling answer that he was thinking about Robert the Bruce seeing a spider before the Battle of Bannockburn. And after this, he stood up and went to their bedroom. He came back down around 7.30pm and announced he was going out leaving into the darkness of the cold, clear night. At Stanfield Hall, Isaac, Isaac Jr. and Isaac Jr.'s wife were finishing their day off with a game of cards. It was around 8pm when Isaac stood up from the table and told others he was going outside for a moment. Some claim he was going out for fresh air or to have a smoke, while others say he was answering a call of nature. With him gone, the idle chatter and card play carried on, until the peace of the evening was shattered as a gunshot ripped through the air just outside the hall. Isaac Jr. jumped to his feet and ran to the door, only to find his father dead just outside the hall, shot at close range in the chest. A later examination showed that his heart had been totally obliterated by the force of the shot. But sadly, Isaac Jr. had little time to raise the alarm, or really process what he was seeing before a second shot was fired, striking him, mortally wounding him. The second shot and his calls for help brought both his pregnant wife Sophia and a housemaid, Eliza Chesney. They came into the hall's lobby just as the gunman entered the home, carrying a pair of pistols. He fired at both of them, hitting Eliza in the hip and Sophia in the arm, wounding them both before walking further into the house. Throughout Stamford Hall, everyone ran and hid. A butler, James Watson, had come to investigate the first shot. But nearing the door, he saw Isaac Jr. shot and ran for his life, hiding himself in the pantry. Reported at the time as a stark contrast to that of Eliza the maid, who in those initial moments had a chance to escape but refused to leave Sophia's side, leading to them both being shot. After some time of silence, a brave few left their hiding places, only to find notes dropped around the house, reading, There are seven of us here, three of us outside and four of us inside the hall all armed as you have seen us to. If any of you servants offer to leave the premises or follow us, you will be shot dead. Therefore, all of you keep to the servants' hall, and you will not take any harm, for we have only come to take possession of the property. Signed, Thomas Jeremy, the owner. The letter, of course, had nothing to do with Thomas Jeremy. As for one, why would you sign a letter that was going to be left at the scene of such a crime? And the other way, there was no way he could have written such a letter as it was widely known that he was illiterate. Of course, given what was going on around Stamford Hall, it's no surprise no one was really thinking about this, and there was much worry about what they should do. Follow the letter and stay put, or try and make a run and get help, 
as both Sophia and Eliza were still alive but badly wounded, and both suffering from wounds that at the time could easily have proven fatal. Sophia would in fact go on to lose her arm, and Eliza had suffered a compound fracture to the hip. It was the hall stable groom who chose to take the risk of finding help. He snuck out of the house, avoiding the main entrance, as it was the one most likely to be watched, waded through the moat and ran to a local farm, where he took a horse and rose to raise the alarm in Wyndham. Whereupon informing the town's magistrate, William Cann, a telegraph was sent to Norwich, asking for armed police assistance. While all this was going on, James Rush returned home at around 9.30, telling Emily that if anyone asked, he'd only been gone for ten minutes, before going straight to bed. The police arrived from Norwich in the early hours of the next morning, and found what they called a scene of utter dismay. The father and son still lying dead where they had fallen. Sophia and Eliza had been moved to their rooms, and most of the servants had barricaded themselves in the home, but no sign of the alleged marauding gunmen the letter had promised were found. The survivors must have been quick to point the finger at Rush, as the police soon descended on Potash Farm, forming a perimeter around it. But they waited until 5.45am when they saw a fire had been lit to make their move. Led by PC Pout, they knocked on the door and demanded to see Rush. As he appeared from upstairs, Pot approached and said, You must consider yourself my prisoner on the suspicion of the murder of the two Mr. Jermys last night. To which Rush replied, I hope you don't suspect me of doing it. With Rush now in custody, both his home and Stanfield Hall were properly searched and the witnesses interviewed. The search of both properties was described at the time by the Chief Constable of the Royal Force as such a search was never mounted before. Many of the staff at Stanfield told of a cloaked and possibly masked man who attacked the hall armed with at least pistols, but the cook Margaret Reed had seen him reloading as he followed the wounded Mrs Jeremy into the house. And although no one had seen the killer's face, they all agreed he carried his head to one side, much as Rush was known to do. Little else was found in the hall other than a ramrod, believed to have belonged to a blunderbuss, a weapon that would be corroborated by a local surgeon, Mr Nichols, who, after examining the two bodies and claiming from their injuries he believed this was most likely the weapon used to kill the pair. The search of Rush's home turned up a pair of pistols, although they were not the ones used in the shooting. Several cloaks, a wig and even a fake beard. Under police guard, he was taken back to Stanfield Hall, where Sophia and Eliza were asked to identify him. Both glad he did, claiming he had to have been the killer, recognising his body type and the way he carried himself. Rush was held locally until the end of the coroner's inquest on the 19th of December, after which he was formally tried for murder and sent to Norwich Prison. Rush naturally claimed he was innocent and that a mystery man had been the one to kill the two in order to frame him. While James awaited his trial, Emily gave statements about her actions leading up to the crime, clearing herself of any involvement. Isaac and Isaac Jr. were buried in Wyndham Abbey on the 5th of December to a full congregation. And rather interestingly, and once again telling of his character, James refused to eat any of the prison food he was provided while in Norwich Prison, instead ordering his meals from the nearby Bell Hotel just across the road. His trial began on the 24th of March 1849 at the Norfolk Assizes, overseen by Judge Baron Rolfe. The story of the case had spread far and wide and had gripped the rather macabre interest of the Victorian public. Hundreds had come to view the scene of the murder, among them Charles Dickens on the 12th of January 1849, who said that Stanfield Hall had a murderous look that seemed to invite such a crime. In the courtroom, the public box was filled to bursting, in every part by gentlemen and ladies of the highest respectability, including several noblemen. The court ended up having to sell tickets for each day, as so many wanted to watch. Rather shockingly, despite the huge amount of evidence against him, Rush had decided not only not to plead guilty as soon as he entered the court, but also to forego a lawyer or any kind of representation, instead opting to defend himself in court. Unsurprisingly, this did not do him much good. In fact, at times he often hastened his own downfall. Several witnesses told of the long-running bad relationship between him and Isaac, and he had often been heard to make threats against the man and his family, and how he was just days away from losing his home to the mortgage foreclosures, and the death of Isaac was one of the only things that could bring a stop to it. 
Even more damning were the witnesses from the night of the shooting itself. Among them, Eliza Chesney, who told of the shooting and being badly wounded by Rush. Still unable to walk at the time, she had to be carried from her home in Wyndham to the court in Norwich, on a specially made chair by a group of men acting in a relay system. Even Emily Stanford took the stand against him, something that Rush seemed to be especially annoyed about, cross-examining her for seven hours, until he had left her in tears and was outright threatening her, causing the judge to step in and stop him. But Emily had played her part, and told that James had been out for at least two hours, not just the ten minutes as he had wanted her to say, more than enough time to commit the shootings and return. Thomas Jeremy was called from London to testify about the letter bearing his name left at the shooting. His time on the stand was a very short one, Judge Rolf asking, Can you write? and him replying simply, No, sir. The letter was quickly established to have definitely been that of a forgery. There are many things you could say James was lacking, but bravado was clearly not one of them. His self led defence lasted for 14 hours, but at no point actually helped rather just rambled on incoherently about the character of some of the witnesses, and truly damned himself with a slip of the tongue while questioning a Maria Blanchflower, who had passed the killer on the night as he approached the hall, asking her, did you pass me quickly? And in doing so, implicated himself at being at the scene of the crime. His long-winded and rambling defence was ultimately a fruitless gesture. It may have taken him 14 hours to defend himself, but it took the jury about six minutes to find him guilty of the murders, and after a moment of excitement, the court fell silent as Judge Rolf put on the traditional black cap and passed sentence. It only remains that I pronounce the awful sentence of the law upon you, and it is that you be taken back to the place from which you came, and from thence to the place of execution, and that you be there hanged by the neck until you are dead, and that after death your body be buried within the precincts of the jail, and may the Almighty have mercy on your soul. With his official job done, he added a few words of his own feeling on the matter. It is a matter of perfect indifference to society at large, what your conduct may be during the final days remaining to you, being, as you are, an object of unmitigated abhorrence to everyone. Other than a few unknown words said to himself under his breath, Rush was led out of the courtroom in silence to await his death. While locked in his cell in Norwich Prison, he tried to convince anyone who visited him of his innocence, at times doing it in a very arrogant and know-it-all sort of manner, and other times acting as he had suddenly become deeply religious. But no one believed or listened to him. His execution was carried out on the 21st of April 1849 at Norwich Castle at 12 noon. And as this case had grown so popular across Britain, the city was packed, both with locals and those coming from further afield with as many as 20,000 people travelling to Norwich to watch him die. Extra special trains had been put on to bring people up from London to see this, although one of these trains never made it to the city, being turned back at Attleborough when it became clear that it was filled with members of various London gangs and pickpockets who had come up from the capital to prey on the event. To top this off, it was also market day, so the city was busier than usual, and the normal stallholders had moved, to walk among the growing throngs of onlookers to sell their wares. To add even more to what must have been an incredibly hectic day in the city, musicians had appeared, wandering among the crowds, singing rather hastily made-up songs about the killer and his crimes. As was often the case with hangings, the crowds came from all walks of life, including the entire staff of Norwich Union, as Isaac had been a member of the board of directors of it at the time of his death. The whole company was given half a day off to attend. The morning, though, was a much quieter affair for the condemned. He ate a small breakfast at around 9am, washed himself, and cleaned the shirt that he was to be buried in with hot water. As time grew closer, the city settled into a tense anticipation. A large black flag was hung over the entrance of the castle, and then, at 11am, the bells of St Peter Mancroft began to ring out their death knell. Rush was taken from his cell to the turnkey's receiving room, where he met the executioner, William Calcroft. Upon seeing him, James asked the prison governor, Is this the man that is to do the business? It was just after twelve that Calcroft was satisfied that Rush had been bound enough for the execution, his hands tied in place, and he was led from the castle to the gallows constructed on the bridge, a journey of about sixty yards, accompanied by the prison chaplain reading out, I am the resurrection, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
At first, it looked as though Rush himself was also praying as he looked up to the skies. But then he asked the prison governor to come over to him and began to speak. Mr. Penston, I have a last request to make of you. It is that the bolt be withdrawn while the chaplain is reading the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and his fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us forevermore. Penson told him that he would, but he had no intent on going through with it. He believed Rush was planning something. What it was, he did not know. But he made it clear to Calcroft that the signal to hang Rush would come from him and no one else. They climbed the gallows built on the bridge, facing over the side of the dried moat below where Rush would hang. It was a badly built gallows for its time. Described a clumsy, incoherent structure. As badly arranged and as unsightly in appearance as anyone could conceive, it seems to have been the work of a most unskilful designer. To allow him some privacy, Rush was to be hanged with his back to the crowd, but this seemed to have annoyed him somewhat when he found out, as he turned to face the waiting people, only to think better of it. With one eyewitness reporting, the poor creature looked for an instant at the vast mass of spectators, whose earnest gaze was upon him and every movement he made. He then turned himself round to face the castle, his back being towards the populace. Rush shook hands with the prison governor and was replaced under the beam and the noose placed around his neck. With this, James realised it was all coming to an end, and if the hangman was not careful and his neck did not break, it could be a very slow and painful one for him, and he suddenly became very insistent that the rope was put on right. For God's sake, give me rope enough. Don't be in a hurry. Take your time. And then, after moving his head a little, put the knot up a little higher. Don't hurry. This done, the white hood was placed over his head. All was ready, and the chaplain began to read his final prayer, and Rush waited for his signal he had requested, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He readied himself, but it never came. Not for Rush, anyway. Just as the chaplain approached the fateful line, Henson gave the signal to Calcroft, and Rush fell. The snap of the rope reaching its limit shook the gallows, and for a moment echoed round the jury moat before being drowned out by the cheers and applause of the 20,000-strong crowd. He struggled for a brief moment and then went still. James Blomfield Rush was dead, aged 49. James's body was left on public display for an hour to ensure his death, before being taken down and his death mask made by Giovanni Bansi, the model maker. His death mask was still on display in the castle dungeons when they began their major refurbishment project a couple of years ago. It is currently still ongoing and I personally hope it will remain there on public display once they are finished. He was buried within the castle walls, and his grave is marked simply with his initials and the date of his death. The younger Rush children, two of the older ones were already over 18, were given to a member of his wife's family to look after and raise. Emily Stanford and Eliza Chastney became well known from the trial, and the public took their plight to their heart, raising money to help them with their lives. £10,000 were raised for Emily alone but she only ever claimed £600 of it, which she used to emigrate to Australia with her brother. While there, she met and finally married a German merchant before the couple moved back to Europe and settled in Berlin. A further £560 were raised for Eliza, including £25 from Queen Victoria. She would recover from her wound. She married a carpenter and they moved to Cambridge, where they raised a family together. From a practical standpoint, the execution may seem to have gone without a hitch but the authorities in Norwich were very unhappy about it. The sheer number of people who had come to watch had brought the city to a standstill, and because of this they brought in new, stricter rules on how hangings would take place. They would no longer happen at weekends, and they would happen early in the morning, to cut down on the amount of people that would be able to get there. And from this day onwards, the majority in Norwich would be carried out at around 8am on a Monday morning. A month after the hanging, during work at Potash Farm, People digging through a pile of manure found the blunderbuss that had been used in the killings, somehow missed by the police and their large-scale search they claimed to have undertaken. The life, well more accurately the death of James, became hugely popular across the country. Raw cheap papers carrying his death sold two and a half million copies. Staffordshire Potteries made a line of collectible figures of the crime. This included Rush, Stamford, as well as both his farm, Stamford House and Norwich Castle. Items that today are worth around £600 each. 
a life-size waxwork of James Rush was installed in the Chamber of Horrors in the Madame Tussauds in London in 1849, and it would remain there until 1971. His crime inspired several novels, including one by Margaret Gaberville Verlong under her male pen name, Joseph Schering. It was also the inspiration for the 1948 film Blanche Fury. Given its somewhat sordid reputation, Potash Farm was eventually renamed Hethelwood Farm, a name it would carry for many years, but has now since been demolished and the site makes up part of the Lotus factory near Wyndham. Stanfield Hall itself would remain in the Jeremy family until it was sold off in 1920. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. This was the Stanfield Hall Murders, a crime that shook a county and a country. And this was a little bit of history.